So now I want to welcome everybody to the conference on lessons learned um, from the recently concluded uh, auction. Um, I am not going to have a long introduction because uh, I want to get immediately to the panels. I just want to say a couple of things at the outset. I am not going to introduce every panelist um, and every speaker. You all, I think, should know who they are. Um, and if not, you're probably at the wrong conference. Um, I do want to say that the idea of this conference is um, lessons learned for the future. So we are not going to be getting into the, the nitty gritty um, if there, at, of, of things that will never recur. So if there is something that really bothers you about the way this auction was conducted that was unique to this auction, you can, you can keep it to yourself or in the bathroom you can go scream at the mirror or something <laughs> like that, but no reason to, to take everyone else's time if it's not going to be something that would, uh, that would ever um, arise again. And the final thing that I want to say just by way of understanding the running order. So we're going to have panelists who will talk for up to 12 minutes. Discussants will, will talk up to 10. Some of them might not use any of that sort of time. And then we're going to have, um, and then have audience. We'll have two mics going around the audience. You just raise your hand, catch my eye, and, I will, um, and I'll call on you. I want this to be as interactive um, as possible, as iterative as, um, as possible. And I'll just tell you, I've told all of the panelists and the discussants, and so you all will now know, in addition to whatever they want to talk about, there are four questions that I'm going to be putting to, well, or I have, have put to them, and I can, you all in the audience can think about them as well, um, and they are the, the following. Um, you know, for each of you, what are the three main lessons for the future um, from this auction um, for you and why? Um, on what, if anything, have you changed your mind in light of the course of the auction? Which of the auction rules played out differently from what you were expecting? Um, and what does that tell us? And where might we use a two-sided auction like this um, next? And what, if any, changes would you recommend for those next uses? So without any um, further ado, let's start. This panel, we will go um, in, in alphabetical order. We won't do that for all the panels. This panel will go in alpha order. So we'll start with, um, with Larry at the end. Oh, and one last thing. I'll be sitting here. I will have time cards. I will be ruthless. Um, I'm, I'm warning everybody in advance. Um, so, <laughs> um, Larry, take it away. Oh, one thing, how do I take it away? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I have slides, and I, I, I don't know how to cue them. Ah, so I'm sorry. I thought they had given you that pointer right that Can you pass that down? The one? That's the one? OK. OK. Um, <laughs> does that? Wireless. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go grab Carol right now. <laughs> yeah, we wish that exactly. <laughs> this one, sorry about that. Ah, uh, I was wrong. Okay. Um, there we go. Click right. Okay. Hope I didn't just break it. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, uh, since, uh, since I seem to have the unenviable position of being first, let me first of all uh, thank Stuart and the other organizers. And the other thing is uh, I notice uh, a whole bunch of FCC staff who were saying instrumental would be understating things in a successful incentive auction, so I'd like to recognize them. You know who you are. There are way too many to name. Um, so uh, since I'm first, what I'm going to do is a little bit of a recap and you know, sort of an opinionated uh, recap. And uh, just note the disclaimer at the bottom of the first slide. Uh, 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 we were uh, one of the FCC contractors. We did the auction software, but uh, this represents my personal views and uh, uh, definitely not the FCC's. Okay, so uh, the bidding in the first ever incentive auction concluded in March. Uh, you know the purpose. It was to repurpose low band spectrum from broadcasting to mobile broadband. Uh, it successfully repurposed 84 megahertz, including 70 of license. Uh, the auction uh, has been quite successful in achieving efficient clearing. Uh, the gross revenues were a bit over 19 billion. The clearing cost was 10 billion. 
and it achieved a good competitive outcome. 95% uh, of the spectrum was acquired by bidders that had been deemed uh, to be reserve eligible everywhere. Uh, it comprised a reverse auction and a forward auction. In the reverse auction, television broadcasters bid to voluntarily relinquish their spectrum usage rights. In the forward auction, it was an ascending clock auction for generic blocks followed by an assignment phase. Um, and our advertising tag, both the reverse and forward auctions were conducted uh, by the FCC using the power auction software. Um, so um, first point, uh, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, all appearances are that the auction achieved efficient clearing. Um, the mechanism had allowed the quantity of cleared license spectrum to be any number up to 10 paired blocks. And based on all publicly available information, it achieved the right amount of clearing. I mean, so first of all, were we better off doing the auction or not? Uh, it seems certainly yes, because the buyer's values apparently exceeded 19 billion and the seller's values were apparently no greater than 10. So there certainly seems to be social surplus generated. And then second, if you look at the amount of clearing, the cost of clearing seven blocks was $10 billion. Uh, in the mechanism, the incremental cost of clearing an eighth block would have been $30 billion, which if you do the translation, it's almost $10 per megahertz pop, which I think exceeds the price in any auction that's been held on the planet. And so doing basic cost-benefit analysis, you would tend to think that it achieves the right number. And by the same token, what was cleared is completely cleared. It's unimp unimpaired. They're contiguous to one another. And they're aligned well uh, for international cooperation with Canada and Mexico. Um, I think if there were, to the extent there have been any criticisms uh, after the auction, it's basically been that the net proceeds were lower than uh, at least uh, scored by the CBO. So what I want to say is a little bit on the forward side and a little bit on the reverse side. Because if the proceeds are lower than you anticipated, it's got to be, in a sense, that either the revenues were lower than expected or the cost was higher than expected or both. So on the forward side, uh, the revenues in the incentive auction are explained by three factors. Verizon didn't bid, AT&T pulled the plug on its bidding, and DISH and US Cellular did not invest in entities seeking bidding credits. Now, the revenues have been compared unfavorably to the revenues of the AWS 3 auction, uh, which had net revenues of $41 billion. Um, what you'd in sense like to know is what would have happened in the incentive auction if those factors hadn't come into play. And of course, we can't, do, we can't really consider that in any formal way since it didn't happen. But we can look at AWS 3 and ask the counterfactual what would have happened if the same factors had come into play. So in the actual AWS 3 auction, uh, AT&T, <coughs> out of the 41 billion total, AT&T accounted for 18 billion, Verizon accounted for 10 billion, and then there were some others. But you'd look at it right off and say, well, if they accounted for two thirds, and you pulled the plug on them, uh, you'd probably expect lower revenues. So we did a simulation. Basically, what we did was um, we looked at the, object the apparent objectives, the apparent license values that bidders placed in the AWS 3 auction, and then basically ran the counterfactual, which you could do since 
we ran through the lower prices in AWS 3 before we got to the higher prices. And our simulation um, basically finds that uh, the revenues would have only been 16.5 billion. So in other words, it may be it may be a mistake to sort of just look at what should be the intrinsic value in an auction. Uh, the actual prices generated in an auction can be extremely sensitive to participation, as this illustrates. You basically have uh, revenues of under 40% of what were actually achieved in AWS 3 if uh, you pull out Verizon and almost completely pull out AT&T. Um, then as far as the reverse auction, um, I'll phrase it as that while the $10 billion cost of clearing the 84 megahertz appears credible, the incremental cost of clearing additional spectrum may come across as excessive. I mean, uh, this is a smooth version of uh, the graph. Um, in particular, all the numbers between 0 and 84 are just guess, but you'd expect it to have that shape. Uh, and as was noted, the incremental cost, if you were going to do an eighth block, was 30 billion, a ninth block was 14 billion, a tenth block was 32 billion. Um, so if you ask, um, why was the cost above 84 megahertz, above the seven blocks, so sharply increasing? I would say it's been explained by at least three factors. So one of them is channel 37, that basically there was a lot of overhead in going from seven to eight, uh, and uh, so that by itself would uh, create significant incremental costs. Second, you simply have increasing marginal costs here because you're getting lower value stations to relinquish before you get higher value stations to relinquish, so the marginal cost is necessarily going to go up. The third factor uh, that seems to have been present, and there may be more than three, is supply reduction. What I mean by supply reduction, this is the mirror image of classic demand reduction in auctions. Um, uh, I, along with Peter Crampton, Pissy Rostek, Wareka, wrote about that in generality while Duraselsky and others studied literally supply reduction uh, in the reverse auction, and there seems to be reasonably apparent evidence that supply reduction was in place. For example, uh, OTA Broadcasting apparently owned 11 stations in the Pittsburgh area, uh, five of them won in the incentive auction, and so you might view the other six as being stations that were pulled from the auction in order to generate higher prices for the ones that actually were sold. Um, or to put the whole thing differently, the reverse auction design, uh, which focused on obtaining uh, an obviously strategy-proof mechanism for single-minded bidders, perhaps could have paid greater attention to the possibility of gaming by uh, multi-minded bidders. Uh, just the last thing to say something quickly about is the spectrum reserve. Some people have reached the, uh, uh, I think, incorrect conclusion that because the spectrum reserve was non-binding, it was uh, necessary. Uh, so when the commission considered the, uh, the proceedings, um, they wrote, we agree with the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, one of our nation's expert antitrust agencies, that there is a risk of foreclosure in downstream wireless markets. A <coughs> provider might be the highest bidder in a spectrum auction, not because it will put the spectrum to its highest use, but because it is motivated to engage in a foreclosure strategy. And if you look at sub one gig spectrum before the auction, the two, nation, two of the nationwide operators held 73%, the next two uh, held only 15%. Um, uh, and meanwhile, this was viewed as the last opportunity in the foreseeable future for somebody to acquire at an auction. Uh, so I'll just use the words that I have written here. 
uh, that the spectrum reserve was non-binding does not prove that it was unnecessary. It is equally likely that the policy was successful in making a foreclosure strategy impossible and encouraging and emboldening participation by smaller bidders. Uh, thanks. No, good, excellent, on timing, very impressive. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Carla Hoffman, take it away. Okay. Ah, oh, it works. Okay, uh, so I'm Carla Hoffman from George Mason University, and basically I'm talking from the perspective of the optimization team who is in the second row over here, and it really is their good works that I'm talking about, although the opinions are mine and do not reflect either the team who may have other opinions or clearly the FCC. What I really want to highlight today is the remarkable collection of talent that made this auction work. This was not an auction of very few people sitting in a room figuring out a clever economic <coughs> theoretical design. It was a huge collection of people that had to work together. And first and foremost, I have to acknowledge Gary Epstein, who just ran this project in a way that was truly remarkable and had all of the major internal players engineer. We, it couldn't have been done without a whole revamping of TV study and how interference was calculated. You needed the wireless bureau, the media bureau, international, legal, who had to write up all of this mathematics, um, the IT. The IT worked without any, you know, there wasn't a little auction that tested it before we did the big auction. It just happened. Um, there are two people I really want to highlight as just great people who did the administration and got the job done. One is Melissa Dunford, who really was a systems engineer for this project and kept everybody moving forward. She would let everybody know, if you want this auction on this date, then um, the report and order has to go here, and these public notices have to go here, and did all of the testing of the software and made sure all of the pieces fit together. Also want to acknowledge Sasa Javid, who really just kept testing software, kept testing the auction designs, made sure that a uh, TV study would continually be updated and up to date. This is no trivial matter. And then there's, of course, not only the software, but the tutorials and the number of people who were, who got their voice heard within the FCC. Of course, Auctionomics and Power Auctions got the job done. I mean, it was an auction that fit together. But more important than anything, I really want to acknowledge Evan Quirrell. He had this idea many, many, many years ago. And the trouble was, how do you create substitutes in this very complicated system? And they weren't pure substitutes, they were partial substitutes. And then he worked to get the legislation that authorized the auction, he worked to get the structure in place, so he worked to get Gary in and have a team that was called the Incentive Auction Tax Force, and he continually just asked important economic questions. So what was the role of the optimization team? The optimization team, I came on relatively late to this project, but the optimization team was there when there was trying to figure out how to get legislation passed and have been working with policymakers. I mean, I really commend, it's possibly the only time I know of where analysts were in the room all of the time to hear the complaints <coughs> of the industry, the concerns, and then try to use that information to get the job done. Um, we were, you know, people said it's impossible to actually solve these problems but the FCC somehow believed we could, which is remarkable to me. Um, so, and there is now a transition plan, which was also part of the job of the optimization team. So what are lessons learned? 
Well, first of all, I would call that this, this market design was extraordinarily <coughs> robust over a lot of things that happened between the time the policy was set and the end of the auction. There was the AWS 3 auction where a lot of money was, was spent. There was the evolution of microcell technology so that people are really interested in other parts of the spectrum band. Um, and there was an announcement that said that the spectrum was going to be offered so people could wait and possibly think about using other spectrum. Um, AT&T was awarded first net contract, which gives them spectrum. And there was lots of talk about very large, important mergers. So there were lots of unpredictable events, but this mechanism transformed a lot of spectrum, 70 megahertz of spectrum for wireless use, and then there is the uh, unlicensed use as well. And I think really important is that TV viewers aren't gonna really see a difference. When they, they will actually see the major networks that they expect to see broadcasting. Public broadcasting will continue to broadcast throughout the country. Um, how did this work? I think it worked because the incentive task force made it work. There was communication with everybody. I mean, I commend the task force for being willing to take every single meeting that occurred. Uh, there was the belief that it could be done, and there was a culture that said everybody is gonna respect each other and trust each other to do the right thing. Going forward, where do I think the, this option might be used? I don't know, but first of all, we still need to have a successful transition. And that means that, again, there needs to be the trust, the flexibility, <coughs> and the oversight. Um, it would be really interesting to ask the question, could Europe do the same? That is, could you have Europe, I don't know if they need an auction, because I don't know how many, uh, how much space there is and whether they can just repack the way Canada was repacked or whether or not you really need an auction, but you certainly want to repack it as an entity, not each country doing their own thing. Uh, the other thing is using, having US government spectrum um, transformed, and I think the airline may, air industry may be the classic example where if they could have funds back to, um, because to take a more modern network, then they'd be willing to give up the spectrum to do that. Um, and the last question I would ask the audience is how do you evaluate an auction success? I don't think it's the amount of money that goes into the treasury. I think it's whether or not the spectrum is being put to the right use and I think the auction proved that you could move spectrum to its highest <coughs> use, but it might be complicated and it might take time. So that's all I have to say. Peace. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll moderate myself. Then. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, um, I am Ilya Segal, and just as other speakers, I uh, took some part uh, in designing this auction, uh, consulting for the FCC with Actionomics and Paul Milgram, but I'll just express my own personal opinions. So just to step, uh, make, uh, take one step back, uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about why the auction was needed at all. Uh, if, uh, I don't know if any of you know this uh, joke, how many economists it takes to change a light bulb? The answer is zero, right? Because the free market will change it. <laughs> so we sometimes call it the cost theorem. So, uh, and actually some people in this room had, I think, the same view. Uh, here's a statement. What would happen if the government was not in the middle between broadcasters and wireless carriers? Then it would take place in 30 days. 120 megahertz would be transferred, but if the government gets involved, hopefully they will get it done uh, by the end of 2014. <laughs> so that's a Preston pattern here. <laughs> he said that in 2012, it turns out he was too optimistic. 
about the government. So, so why did we need this auction? Why not just let the market do it? So here's a very important idea in economics that what makes markets work is a substitution between goods. So if apples and oranges are substitutable, then they compete with each other. Uh, demand, so when buyers compete with each other, they will offer higher prices. When sellers compete with each other, they offer lower prices. And in some te ideal textbook case, when you have many perfect or very close substitutes, we get textbook efficient markets. Uh, but what makes market fail is complementarity. So if instead of apples and oranges <coughs> being substitutes, you actually want to have a fruit sandwich and you want them in the right proportion, and then uh, when they're complementary, they will hold out for larger slices of the pie, and that actually risks the possibility that breakdown, bargaining will break down completely. This is an, one example of bargaining breakdown. In the picture, here's this little house that held out presumably for a lot of money, and so you had to build around it, and that would be a pretty inefficient outcome if you have this holdout TV stations in the mobile spectrum. So in the spectrum repurposing, there are several complementarities. There's always complementarity between buyers and sellers, but that's kind of familiar uh, and not a big deal if the, there's competition on the buyer and the seller side. But the main complementarity here was between diverse stations that needed to be acquired to create usable contiguous spectrum blocks. Now, how did the auction solve this complementarity problem? The main idea was what Carla already mentioned, and uh, I understand that it's due to Evan, is the idea that FCC has the right to retune stations uh, if they ho uh, hold out, if they don't participate or ask for too much money. So that made say, stations into substitutes to some extent, and not perfect substitutes, depending on the, how the interference graph um, looks like. Uh, so this is the main idea. But then on top of it, there are several other things that were important. So one thing that uh, was developed by Actionomics, SATFC software, which looked for all possible repackings in, uh, and that in a very short time, basically sometimes within one minute, within several minutes, uh, it couldn't always solve this problem, but it solved it almost all the cases. And so it turned stations into, because of the repacking, it turned stations that are very different, maybe in different parts of the country, into substitutes, and they were made to compete with each other for lower <coughs> prices for being acquired. So another um, important thing, I think, was the clock auction format, because it made it obvious to bidders, at least if you have a single station, that you, you cannot really manipulate the price you're getting. Even if you don't trust the FCC, you don't trust how the auction computations are, there is really nothing you can do that would be better than just bidding and uh, your true value, basically bidding until the price goes down uh, below your true value. So it makes competition very easy for stations, even though they're not very sophisticated auction participants. Most of them are, uh, are not. So another thing that helped competition is, I think, scoring, which is it allowed invited large stations to compete with the small stations on a more level playing field. Otherwise, large stations wouldn't be offered so much money, and they would they would uh, just stay out of the auction and there wouldn't be as much competition in the auction. And finally, on top of all that, I think FCC did such a great job in its outreach uh, program to broadcasters, so participation was really excellent and that ensured that there was a lot of competition during the auction. Now, uh, was the auction successful? Actually, Larry already talked about many of the issues and I fully subscribe to everything he said. Uh, uh, so one issue is uh, when the spectrum that was acquired, was it acquired at the minimal disruption of society and minimal cost to FCC? So here I can add a little bit because Actionomics actually did some independent simulations based on completely public uh, data and public software. And it, the simulations show that even though the auction is not guaranteed to be fully efficient, but uh, it actually, the value lost to TV is within 10% of the minimal in practically all of the simulations, and uh, uh, actually the cost in terms of money is actually much lower than if you were to run the Vickery auction benchmark, if you know what it is. If you don't know, then don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now uh, did it sell the spectrum clear at the maximal benefit to society and uh, um, maximal revenue to FCC? Well, we don't know for sure, but as far as we can hear, there was not much gaming in the auction, so bidders who got Spectrum, they wanted Spectrum, bidders who didn't get Spectrum, they didn't get the Spectrum. So basically the Spectrum went to people who were really the most interested in it, which is how it's supposed to be. Right Now, uh, whether the 
um, clearing target uh, that ended up was efficient. Actually, Larry talked about this, and uh, it looks like based on the information that we get, it was the right amount to clear, and so Larry made some points about this that are really good. Okay, so this is actually another thing that Larry mentioned, which is just looking at the uh, cost for different clearing targets, and it's basically the same picture, but I put it on the log scale. <laughs> and on the log scale, it looks much simpler, because basically it's a straight line, <laughs> right? So the points fit very neatly on a straight line, and basically, and that's not surprising, basically it corresponds to the textbook case of constant elasticity supply curve, uh, except that the elasticity of supply is kind of low, it's 0.23 by my back of the envelope, Calculation. So, uh, so you could ask, why is the supply so inelastic? Well, the usual story would be that there are big diversity between sellers. There are some stations that really ask for a lot of money, and they exited when the prices went down. And there are other stations that were willing to accept very little. So, very uh, heterogeneous stations, and that actually means that you know this clearing target was the right one because you know. Uh, if you were to clear more, you would have to acquire these really valuable stations. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, clearing this one was cheap because there are not so many valuable stations you have to acquire. Of course, so, you know it's possible that supply reduction contributed to this, as Larry mentioned, uh, to making the elasticity lower, and we would need more detailed analysis uh, to see how much it actually contributed. But I would say there is no easy fix to supply reduction because basically the only way to eliminate this kind of manipulation is to just pay more to the uh, owners of multiple stations. So in the end, it's not clear that you can reduce the cost this way. I mean, you could make the outcome slightly more efficient, but it could also become more expensive to you. So it's not obvious that you could uh, be very successful at reducing the cost of the auction with some more complicated designs. Okay, uh, so, uh, so here's another thing. We were all clearing targets worth trying. I think the main problem, at least it was a kind of PR issue, is that the auction just took so long. Couldn't it have been done better? And uh, here was, was one way to done it in half the time, to have it done in half the time, which is not all the clearing targets were actually worth trying, and there's a very simple idea that, uh, so the way uh, the auction was uh, uh, designed is that it tried to clear the largest possible target subject to some constraint on the average impairment. But the economic approach says you have to think about the marginal uh, uh, analysis, not average. Mm -hmm. So basically, you just have to ask yourself, is it really the marginal, is the marginal gain of how much spectrum you clear by increasing the target, is it worth um, uh, the loss in the TV spectrum? So for example, if you, clear, if you ask, was it worth while clearing 126 megahertz, then uh, the problem is, well, without impairments, it would be worth it because you would create 10 megahertz of spectrum for mobile out of 12 megahertz of TV. But given the actual impairments, it turns out you actually get less spectrum in LA and New York by doing 126, actually nationwide you get less than one, less than six megahertz, and that seems like it's not worthwhile getting less than, basically the yield is less than 50%. Now by the same argument, clearing 108 uh, uh, was not worthwhile even without any impairments because the yield of usable spectrum on that was only 42%. So basically these two targets were not worthwhile clearing, and so the auction would take um, only ha half the time if they were skipped. Uh, another thing, um, um, uh, okay, I'll skip this, it's a technical issue, but you could, it were possible, I think, to use higher bid increments and decrements, which would also speed it up without much loss to efficiency. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, I mean, the, there's just the one um, uh, mathematical point that the loss in efficiency is quadratic in the uh, amounts of the increments and decrements, so if you, uh, go from 5% to 10%, you go maybe uh, roughly from one quarter of a percent loss to 1% loss, which is, let's say it's not a big deal, and that would also yield a substantial speed up to the auction. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, uh, at the challenge in designing this auction is because, as Carl said, <coughs> it's uh, uh, very important for the auction to be robust because it's a once in a lifetime auction, at least it was built as such, uh, involving billions of dollars. It's very different from having uh, designing uh, auctions like advertising auctions online, which is actually it's billions of dollars in total, but each auction itself could be one dollar or 10 cents. So uh, here you don't really have any room for experimenting. 
uh, learning. There's not much data you can use to design it, so you must rely on theory, on economic theory, a lot more than on the data. Uh, the builders themselves also don't have a lot of room or experience, so they could make mistakes during the auction. They couldn't, may not understand the option, so it's crucial to have an auction that is robust, that makes it easier for builders to participate. Another point is that um, uh, you, one way to make it simpler, you have to make, uh, uh, and faster, you have to make some, uh, of course, it's a politically the hardest thing to do, but you have to prejudge that some things are not likely to be optimal. For example, some of the clearing targets, because the auction is uh, kind of a heuristic um, uh, uh, auction, so it's not going to be fully optimal, but it has to be simple, and you, and you have to make some decision how to simplify it um, by ruling out some allocations. So it, this auction demonstrates it's possible to combine very complex computations with uh, uh, easy uh, bidding interface and uh, that encourages even non-sophisticated bidders to participate. You made it perfect. All right, so now we have our, our discussion. I don't, know, I don't know if you want to be there or you want to stand up at the, everybody should feel, f should feel free to go up to the, to the podium as well. I'm, ha I'm happy to say. All right, you're on the yeah. clock. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So my name is Michael Strauss. I'm a professor of economics at Stanford, and in this auction, I was not on the design side. I was advising a bidder, Comcast, working with David Salant, who is going to be talking in the second uh, session. So uh, as an academic, I'm used to conferences where everyone emphasizes that they don't have any conflicts of interest. So it's kind of refreshing to have a conference where pretty much every single person has some sort of a conflict of interest. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Uh, having said that, I think it's a great idea to organize the conference right now when we don't yet know what the next auction is going to be. So the hope for intelligent discussion, actual revelation of information is the height. It's only going to get worse over time. And having said all that, you know, I'm going to speak for myself uh, and you know, I'll try to be completely unbiased and take sort of a social planner point of view and I think many of others will do the same. Uh, second point I want to emphasize before starting to kind of ruin the celebratory mood is that, which I think the second session is gonna do a lot more of that. Okay. Um, I do want to emphasize that I think that the entire project of spectrum auction starting from the you know, 1990s until you know, culminating in this is a major success both for economic policy and for economic theory. Uh, and honestly, you know, I'll, I'll be shocked if in the next few years we don't see this whole body of work recognized with a Nobel Prize in economics. So, you know, I do think it's a, an absolutely uh, fantastic achievement. Okay, having said all that, it wouldn't be fun if I just talked about uh, confirming all the designers on the auction, how great everything was. So, let me give you a couple of lessons. You know, there are a bunch of lessons around the book. Let me give you a couple that I think are conceptually interesting uh, and worth thinking about going forward. So, I think the thing that I didn't think about before <coughs> sort of participating in this auction and thinking about this auction is, you know, I think we all think about having, you know, a demand curve for spectrum, right? And, you know, when Ilya was talking and, and Larry and everyone, they say, well, the efficient amount of spectrum got traded here is a demand curve, here are the marginal values. Sounds totally reasonable. That's how we do auctions. That's how we usually design auctions. Now, when an auction takes many, many months to complete, I realize it's actually not proper to think about a demand curve. And the reason is, you know, as Carla said, there are unpredictable things. Well, the one thing you can predict is that over a year-long auction, unpredictable things will happen. Something will happen. And here is an interesting feature, right? These auctions are designed in a one, so there is an asymmetry, right? Obviously, demands can go up and down, right? So it's entirely possible that halfway through the auction, Verizon said, oh, we made a mistake, we should have been in this auction. Well, there is nothing they can do, right? They can just sit and watch because they can't even call up someone else and ask them to bid on their behalf because that would be, you know, that would violate all kinds of rules with the auction. So the demand can't go up, but it can absolutely go down, right? So we saw it was AT&T, right? So when Larry was making those calculations, he said, well, you know, AT&T drops, so we're not going to use them in simulations. But imagine you could design an auction that takes just one week, right? Suppose the auction just from the start, within, you know, we take four days for the reverse, like three days for the forward side, we're done. Well, guess what? All the billions of dollars from AT&T will still be there. Right, because that unpredictable thing would not have had time to happen. Okay, so I think this is something that I didn't think about before, but I think exposed is pretty clear that the longer you run this auction, the lower the realized demand is going to be just due to the mechanics, right? Because activity rules only point in one direction, right? Bidders may change their mind 
to exit the auction, but they cannot change their mind and increase their activity. So I think that's important, and I, and I do think that if there was a magic, you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying I have this magical auction, but if there was a magical auction that took one week to run, we would either see, you know, maybe more spectrum, maybe not, but for sure we would see, you know, higher revenues because AT&T would still be there, right? So that, you know, again, not for sure, but that's, so, and again, I'm not saying that, uh, I know how to do that, but sort of to echo Ilya, there are real costs to running an auction for a very, very long time. You know, this was the first time, this is a complicated auction, so it made sense to do it conservatively. Uh, in the future, it might make sense to try to think as much as possible about speeding things up. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, one thing that Ilya already alluded to is that uh, maybe we should have skipped some of the stages. Okay, and that, because you know, that was where most of the delay was, you know, was present in having all the stages. Uh, and obviously Congress cannot pass legislation saying, you know, we're gonna skip stage one and stage three and you're gonna clear, you know, these particular things. It would be way too detailed, right? That's just not how it works. But they could write legislation that gives a lot more power to the FCC uh, or to whoever runs these auctions to make judgments, right? And the FCC already makes those judgments, right? So there is one element where they're allowed to and that's the bidding increment, right? And we, we saw that the bidding increment changed over time. They changed it from five to 10% uh, along the way. Uh, and so my suggestion would be to find a way politically to give them a lot more power to use their judgment to do other things to speed things up such as skipping stages and sort of feel them, yeah. Uh, because I think the cost of delay are substantial. Uh, another sort of more technical uh, point and that's a slightly different one is that most of the delay was actually due to the reverse side, right? If you look, look at the total time that it took for the forward side of the auction, you know, stage two and three they just didn't happen. They took you know, no time. Whereas the reverse auction, you had to rerun the whole thing from the very beginning, it took forever. And again, it's the first time such an auction was run, so it made sense to do it this way. Going forward, it would be great to find a way not to do that. Either maybe starting those reverse auctions from the point where they left off in the previous stage, uh, you know, I understand why you can't do it, why it's hard to do literally because repacking may influence how you do this, but perhaps the inefficiency from that will be lower than the inefficiency from waiting for a long time and having bidders change their mind and drop out. Uh, or maybe you kind of pre-run a bunch of possibilities in the, in the very beginning and then from that point on you only have a forward stage. So I think it's definitely something worth thinking about instead of you know, having this drag on forever. Okay, so, uh, one last thing I will, one last point I will make uh, is something so, uh, Larry briefly talked about is reserved versus non-reserved spectrum. Uh, and I fully agree with him. And I think every single economist you would ask will agree that we should find a way to advantage new entrants because otherwise incumbents have higher incentives to buy the spectrum just to foreclose on, on those new entrants. Their profits, monopoly profits are higher than sums of two, you know, players in an oligopoly, uh, but I, I'm not sure in the current auction we ended up with a good outcome, right? If you look at the, just mechanically, you say, well, this, this was great, right? It was fantastic, 95%, as Larry said, 95% of spectrum uh, went to sort of reserve eligible bidders, which is exactly what we wanted. Wonderful, let's pat ourselves on the back. But here's the problem. The prices for reserved and non-reserved spectrum ended up being the same, right? Uh, and you say, well, why is it a problem? You know, the allocation ended up being fine. Well, the problem is you're selling two different goods. One of them is damaged, right? Because you cannot resell that spectrum to certain players, and the other is perfectly fine, and you're charging the same prices for them, right? So if I'm advising a bidder in the next auction, and I think there is a substantial probability of this thing happening, <coughs> well, maybe the reserve eligible bidder should no longer register as reserve eligible. Maybe they would be better off pretending to be not eligible and because they, 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 will not, they will not want to get stuck with this inferior product uh, at the same price as what, what they could have paid for the good thing, okay, for the uh, non-resort uh, non one. Uh, and, you know, th th that would require some different mechanism to find a way for the market to determine <coughs> the premium for reserved versus non-reserved, but I do think the outcome where two different types of goods, one of them is damaged and the other one is not, end up being sold for the same price, that's actually not so great. And that's all I have. Great, so I appreciate everybody actually sticking to their time because given that everybody in the audience is being so impressive, we now have time for questions. So if you can just raise, uh, sure, I see Gary up here and then 
we'll have two mics going around. So I see, unsurprisingly, Gary Epstein wants to jump in. <laughs> not, for the, not for the last time, I suspect. Uh, first of all, I want to thank and compliment the panel. I think it was a great discussion and, and, and a great overview. I only make, want to make two points. One of them is the point that Ilya made and that Michael talked about the um, issue of efficient um, band, um, targets, the 126, 114, 108, and 84. What I'm going to talk about briefly is overlay this with political reality. Okay? And we talked about Congress's power and the Commission's power and the staff's power. And you have to really separate them out. Congress, I think you're exactly right, will write broad legislation. The agency will set the major rules and the staff has the implementation job, but there is no clear, complete separation. The Venn diagrams overlap. And what you're talking about um, doing on the fly are major changes. You would not know, you know what's an efficient or inefficient clearing target until you had the commitments from the broadcasters on March 29th. You just wouldn't know. So after the commitments were in, you're talking about making adjustments. And who makes them? What's the process to make them? How long would they take? What political controversy would they raise? And so that was, that's a consideration in implementing what the good idea that both you guys talked about. Sure. Do you want anybody to respond? Sure. sure. Can I just say one Please. thing about this? So actually, uh, I agree. That I actually fully agree it shouldn't be done on the fly, and there, and there are these political problems. But this th th doesn't have to be done on the fly. So uh, basically, you just need to agree on one number in advance. Uh, uh, and, but the number, which now there was number agreed in advance, what the average impairment should be. Instead, the number should be about the marginal yield of the spectrum. So either way, there are, you know, I'm sure there are lots of political problems like agreeing on a number, but it's much easier than you know, just giving FCC discretion to do things on the fly. And again, just to, to reiterate, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it probably should be done. Because I think the longer mm. you run those auctions, for reasons I explained, the lower you, the demand is going to be. You can only move in one direction. Right, hold on. So I got Alan, and then back after Alan. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, ju just real quick. So, yeah, also, I should say, sorry. If you can identify yourself, everybody, if you can identify yourself, you're asking a question. A guy in the front row. Uh, <laughs> no, Al Alan Ingram, Economist Inc. I'll speak on the uh, second panel. Um, just, just to go back to what you just said, Ilya, and uh, try to match it with something that, that Gary said, you're talking about the marginal yield of a license. Well, that's also something that's supposed to be determined in the forward auction, the marginal value of clearing the marginal block. And so you, you really need to be careful in how you okay. figure out that number because this is the trick in, in forming the initial clearing target if you set it too low, and if you set that, that marginal amount too low, then you've really encountered a big political issue, which is foregone revenue. Right. right. So basically, you need to make a judgment in advance that the you know, value of mobile spectrum will not be, let's say, more than 10 times the value of TV spectrum. And you have to make this judgment anyway. For example, when you set the opening prices to TV stations. So you don't set them to be infinite. So when you set them to be, you know, a billion dollars, then you already make a judgment that, you know, AT and T will not pay ten billion dollars for the spectrum, right? So in so in the same way, yes, you need the judgment so to restrict the scope. The market should still work, but within some restricted scope where we think it's more or less realistic, and that's the same decision that as about setting the opening prices. Just be careful. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bill Tolpeg in OTA Broadcasting. Uh, quick question for you on speeding up the auction itself. Would it be would it have been possible to you know you could hit 126? Would it have been possible to say, well, let's start at 114, and then see if that can close. And if it can't close, we skip down to like 84. And then you say, okay, 84 closes. So then we try to go back up to 108. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but I I'm struggling a little why you couldn't actually go re in in the reverse direction. Well, uh, the problem, it sort of invites uh, manipulations by bidders. So if you think your price might go up uh, and not just go down, then you think that, uh, OK, should I um, exit now? Uh, and, and because that means if I exit now, but then I can come back later, maybe if the price goes up, or 
so you know, in, in theory, it, it's possible to deal with that, but you know, basically, it wouldn't be a clock auction format anymore. It would be like a sealed bid auction where you kind of have to reveal your value uh, before knowing. You have to say, "This is how much I would sell for," and then uh, before knowing what price you will actually get. And uh, I think you know, it's it's there are uh, sealed bid auctions and they work fine. But for this particular setting, I don't think the bidders would actually trust FCC uh, and reveal their true values. And maybe you know, just because it's such a complex uh, auction, I wouldn't really blame them for you know if they don't trust FCC because who knows? They cannot verify how this price is calculated, and they think you know if I reveal my value to be low, maybe that means you know that will result in me getting a lower price. Oh, um, so David, and then two in the back. Uh, can, can you bring it up here, and then and then two people in the back? Yeah, hi, I'm David Salant. I'll be on the next panel as well. Um, I just want to comment on the setting the clearing target. Um, I had the uh, pleasure or wonderful experience of trying to sort through the clearing target optimization algorithm in some detail. It was a pretty complicated problem, design problem, and wasn't perfect. It was pretty good. Um, there's an issue in LA some other people talk about. The issue, just a word on what the issue is, though, there was a lot of pressure to have a uniform band plan across the country. And that was because the mobile operators, for good reason, I think, wanted a uniform yeah. set of equipment. You want the equipment to work the same across the US. Translating that requirement to maximize what's available turned out to be not such a trivial task. I wouldn't say the FCC did the absolute most perfect, wonderful job possible. On the other hand, that might have taken another 10 years to get there. <laughs> And, and so, but, you know, there, there's obviously more to be done to do a better job of that. And the, the real issue was solving how to balance that across multiple stages when you didn't know ex ante how many TV stations to show up. So they had to build in a formula that was flexible. So there's uh, two people in the back and then, and then no, first the two in the back and then, and then here, sorry. Hi, Mark Frathrook with BIA Kelsey. I want to move to the initial pricing, nobody discussed that, and the related Green Hill report, and whether or not that was ended up being somewhat misleading. I mean, I know there was the incentive to have higher prices to entice broadcasters to come in, but in hindsight, might those, that initial price of the top station at $900 million, might that have been too high And the role of the Green Hill report in, um, Affecting broadcasts is the expectations. Sure. Yeah. No, well, I, I want this to be. I want to be as open as possible. Feel free. The only thing is, can somebody get a mic? If Gary wants to jump in on that, by all means. Hmm. I'm happy to defer to others, but I think the Greenhill report served a purpose. Um, there was a price. The, we kept getting requests from broadcasters. How the heck do I know how to enter this auction? What is a reasonable starting price? And it's an auction. I've said this before. Broadcasters, I think I said once that you're not going to, in a forward auction, you're not going to get a Rembrandt for 10 bucks. Okay? In a reverse auction, we disclosed the formula, we said it was high, we said how it was derived, and we said they would be bidding, and stations were going to be unlikely to get the, the, the price. But it turned out that multiple stations got multiple nine-figure figures, payouts, over 100 million bucks from two or $300 million. And so I think that the, the purpose of the Green Hill Report was um, served. Um, the prices would have been higher had there been more on the demand side. That's not something that the commission could control. You're right, there was a lot of discussion about the two Green Hill reports. There, was, there, there, were, there were two that were issued, but I actually think that they did serve a positive pr a purpose and uh, really do not, is, uh, are not a, a case of bait and switch. Uh, I could just add one thing to that, which is um, let, let's return to the theme of robustness. You want to have auction procedures that will perform well under a wide range of circumstances. One of the big unknowns was the demand situation in the forward, the supply situation in the reverse, 
And what that basically says is uh, start high on the broadcast side and start low on the uh, wireless side. And nobody ought to walk in and think that it's bait and switch because auctions usually don't end where they start. <laughs> Uh, so in the back, and then, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so the, yeah, so on this subject, a couple of things. So first of all, I, I, I heard that there's some stations, at least one station, that got initial price. And so certainly that one was happy that the initial prices were not lower. <laughs> so. <laughs> but but I, I'm not suggesting it with a bait and switch, OK? Right. Don't, that, that, that's my, I don't want anybody to infer that, OK? My, my whole point was that the initial prices were much higher than the reserve prices of almost every television station. And that we possibly, instead of the top price being $900 million, you would have got the same participation as $700 million. And thus, you may have gotten a much lower level at stage one, stage two, et cetera. It may not, the end result may have been the same. But the, the varying differences may have been, um, it, wouldn't, it would have came a lot closer in those stages. So we have one in the back, and then uh, Sasha and John Leibovitz. I can't help myself on the Green Hill Report. My name's Eric Stewart, and I work at Entrevision. And my point on the, on the Green Hill Report would be that I was working on a patent litigation fund uh, at a hedge fund when the Green Hill Report came out. And that was, I was like a moth to, a, to, to the flame when the Green Hill Report came out. That caused me to want to solve the algos and figure it out and go pitch my wares to the broadcast industry to try and help them through the process. So the Green Hill Report certainly served a good purpose, if, even if there were a lot of people in hindsight that feel bad about it. My question is, with the value of hindsight, have, have you any thoughts on what could have been if you would have run the forward first and identified the true level of demand and then gone through the exhaustive exercise of um, determining what your supply was. Because the, 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 what took so much time in your own, you know, what you said was having so many of these 52 round reverse auctions, you could, it just seems to me possible, and you design auctions, you're smarter than me, you can tell me. <laughs> well, so one problem with that is impairments, right? Because we don't know, without knowing the participation in the reverse auction, we cannot run really the forward auction because we don't know what we are selling. Uh, and another thing, uh, even if we did that, that wouldn't really sp speed up the reverse auction too much. I, I think there could be some speed up, uh, but you still need to try to clear one target uh, you know, while you think it's feasible. Then when you figure out it's not feasible, you have to reduce the target. And one issue that Mike uh, mentioned is when you reduce the target, do you actually have to start uh, with, uh, to re uh, reset the clock at the high level? And actually, the answer to this, I think uh, you have to do something like that. Otherwise, it becomes more expensive. I mean, it's more a kind of observation about how the heuristic works. It would be more expensive um, and less efficient if you didn't do it. But I mean, there are things you can do. Maybe you, some stations could get higher uh, price decrements than 5%. That would speed things up. But uh, you can't you know, just. Uh, uh, ignore this issue completely. So I think that some speed up was possible, but um, it, you know I'm not sure that would be very big. Um, All right, uh, uh, Sasha, if you need, uh, right in the second row. Yeah. Hi, uh, Sasha Javid from the FCC. Just a couple of points. One, Michael, um, it, the reverse auction did start from the, the point where they left off in the previous stage. As Ilya alluded to, there were stations that got opening prices. So when you have a station that got opening price, you got to restart from the beginning again. So that was one point. Two, on the impairments and stuff, um, some of it was outside of our control. Um, you say it's unknowable. Well, it's not just on the, who shows up in the reverse auction side. It's also what was going on with the international negotiations. And so some of that, that issue that happened with the 126 and the uh, 80, you know, the difference in LA and San Diego was a function of what was going on with our negotiations with Mexico, which was going on, you know, for some period of time after the procedures had been adopted. So that was the two points I want to make. So do you want to respond? Yeah. Well, I just want to comment that I didn't comment at the beginning that 
the remarkable thing about this auction is the in, it was an entire continent that got repacked and has all of the spectrum working together. And that's a real achievement. And part of that, a lot of that goes to Sasha and the International Bureau for doing those negotiations over an extraordinarily long period of time. So I get to an inserted joke about Mexico paying for it? <laughs> John, John Leibovitz in the back. Uh, hi, I'm John Leibovitz, uh, former FCC task force member, and I uh, take responsibility for all the inefficiencies you guys are talking about, <laughs> the BAM plan and the uh, impairments and so forth. Um, so I'll just ask one question, three letters, uh, DRP, question mark. <laughs> Would it have helped? So, uh, well, I think there are first uh, different versions of DRP. Do you want to explain to people? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, the, so the idea of DRP was that uh, even though some stations may be infeasible to add in the TV spectrum, we still try to reduce their prices. Uh, and if they choose to exit, we'll just assign them in the mobile band, uh, as long as that wouldn't create too much impairment. And so in the end, it was uh, nobody liked it, so it had to go. Uh, and I guess the question is uh, whether it would have made a difference. OK, so that's how I understand it. So I think the different, uh, I mean, within F FCC, there are, even in the public notice, I think there are like a couple of different versions of DRP being proposed. Uh, and one, uh, basically, well, like how aggressive or conservative you are about reducing those prices. And I think the um, conservative version wouldn't have made any difference. Uh, and the aggressive version might have made a difference, but probably wouldn't be a good idea anyway, because there were already too many impairments to begin with. So I think really a better way to think about this is in terms of the initial clearing target. So instead of trying to increase impairments, we should just say, OK, when you know uh, the cost is too high, maybe we should just not uh, bother with this clearing target and just go to the next one, which will allow us to reduce the prices to a lot more of the stations. Uh, and so I think, uh, I mean, in retrospect, that would have, could have been a good idea just for the sake of speed up. Uh, I mean, it, I don't, in the end, I don't think it would have made much difference to the outcome, except for just for the speed up, because, um, um, you know, that, that is, I think, uh, the, the main issue with the auction. But uh, I think, uh, in the end, uh, you know, I think it's good that DRP had to go, uh, even though I, you know, there's some people, including me, who liked it. But uh, <laughs> uh, in the end, it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. So anyway, the what, you know, so that's why I think it's fine. It, I mean, it wouldn't be a plus or minus. It just wouldn't have made any difference. All right. One last lightning round question for any of you all. Is there anything as a result of this auction that you've changed your mind on? You have only, and give a, give a short and sweet answer. If, if the answer is no, that's fine. But one last question. Is there anything in light of this auction that you say, gee, I now, I now, I now look at this differently. Hey, I, I now think about this differently. Any, any of you all can, can, can jump in. Also, I want to mention that I think I no longer think of demand function as static. I think in the context of these auctions, they actually go down over time because when they go up, it cannot be reflected in the demand, and when they go down, it can. Anybody else? No, I, I agree just thinking about the time. I mean, we did think about how long it will take, but uh, I think we would have maybe put more <laughs> emphasis on that. Uh, and yes, the dy dynamics part, although I'm not sure in the end, you know, you would say, well, if it were one week, then the, the revenue would be higher. It depends on what, which week it was, <laughs> I think. <laughs> because uh, at least this way, at and paid $1 billion. But if it were one week, but three months later, they would have paid zero. So it's not obvious to me that it's always better to make it shorter from the viewpoint of revenue. Uh, what I'll say just is that uh, the speed up was not something that was completely ignored. I mean, during the design process, the forward auction uh, directly took that into account. There basically were two alternatives, doing the standard SMRA or doing an ascending clock auction. And we actually run, ran simulations, which basically found that the clock auction that was used would, in principle, reduce the number of rounds in the forward <laughs> auction by 2 thirds. Um, so. Uh, 
you know, and so if you look at the forward part, it was a lot faster than anything like AWS 3. All right, well, in the interest of, of speed, I want to keep us uh, on time. So thanks to a great first panel and a reconvening. <laughs> He said we'll reconvene and then I